so hello and good morning to everyone i hope you're having as wonderful morning as i'm having the weather is pretty good in jaipur in fact uh, do you guys have any idea what is today uh, it's 8 september and it's the international literacy day today so welcome to the class and briefly about me also please let me know who all are there and if the audio and the video is clear i guess the audio is clear because i can see it uh, i'm not too sure about the sorry i'm sure about the video but i'm not too sure about the audio so please let me know if the volume is okay all right with that uh, briefly about me i'm sidhi bangar i graduated from bit mesra i have 3 years of teaching experience and more and appeared for four mains in interviews did my post grad from xlri jamshedpur additionally uh, my code is sbus or sp sidhi you can use this code to get an instant 10% off on any of your upsc subscriptions for any course any time and this is my an academy profile id you can follow me here so that you do not miss out any classes that i take on the unacademy platform also if you want to connect with me you can message me on the unacademy app i will surely reward with that uh we have two types of courses one is the plus course under unacademy subscriptions and the another one is the uh, iconic course under the plus courses you get daily live classes which i'm already taking on the unacademy platform at 8:30 pm in the evening these are special classes open to all uh you can chat with me directly ask your doubts answer in the polls and feature yourself in the leaderboards to see your rankings we also have live test and quizzes so that you can test your preparations courses completely aligned to the upsc syllabus as well as under the plus courses you get a complete schedule of how the course is going to run so you can see the syllabus being covered in the course beforehand it's not like you join a class and then you get to know okay this thing won't be taught so you can take an informed decision that's the benefit of the plus courses and most importantly or the most important benefit of the plus courses unlimited access so one subscription gets you unlimited access to all the uh, live and recorded courses the access to recorded courses more than the live one is actually proves to be a boon because uh, a lot of people might have clashes with a lot of classes so in case you want to attend one and you can actually watch the recorded lecture of uh, another class later one so that that is actually a boon so you can do that a lot of people do that they come to my classes and watch the recorded lectures of the other classes whenever they do get time so with that uh, under the iconic program it is plus plus additional benefits of having a personal mentor So under the iconic, you have live classes, test series, unlimited practice and structured schedule of the plus courses. In addition to that, a personal mentor, daily mains question and answer practice, a study planner specifically designed for you, and a personalized feedback from your personal coach. Um, that coach will be chosen by an academy. These are people specially selected to be mentors. They have been mentoring people in and out for so many years. So very very experienced people. who will be there in your upsc journey answering your minute test doubts to your major doubts whatever you have about this examination the iconic fee is 64000 for 12 months and 99000 for 24 months and you can use my code sbus to get 10% off which makes it 57600 for 12 months and 89100 for 24 months and for plus it is 44000 for 12 months and 64000 for 24 months you can use my code sbus to get an instant 10% off making it 39600 for 12 months under the plus and 57600 for 24 months with that uh, choose wisely choose an academy which you've already done and choose iconic use my code sbus to get instant 10% off on any of the upsc csc subscriptions with that this is the special class that i was talking about it happens live at 8:30 pm on the unacademy platform it's free for all everybody can come and join in it's a prelims mini mock test series for current affairs specifically designed for upsc 2020 all right so which is where and let's start the class now the ground rules remain the same in addition to what we have been doing because a lot of 
uh, old students are already here. I just want you to do one thing apart from the ground rules. Have faith in yourselves. I have seen you guys preparing for the last two, two and a half months. I've seen you grow. You are at a very comfortable position. Just a little push and we'll be through the prelims window. All right. So with that, best of luck. And the first question is on your screens. Good morning, everyone. Let me see who all are there. Good morning, Shantani. Good morning, Rhythma. I'm all good, Rhythma. Good morning, Monisha. Good morning, Chandre Rangesh, Afreen. Uh, no, Ronnie, you are on time. You are not late. And good morning, Aditya. Another five seconds and then I'll start the timer. We'll go on a small trip to Europe today. So be prepared for that. Uh, yes, Ronnie, actually that's not a problem. That's like we have democratized the entire platform. You can choose the educator because see what happens is some educator... Uh, teachers in a different language, for example, some people teach only in Hindi, some people teach only in English, some are bilingual teachers. So that's why we have so many educators and the content is also different. So you can choose the content which you want. So I feel it's actually more choices. You can choose, you can attend the classes, you can choose which teacher suits you best and then go ahead. And for certain teachers, if even if you don't like their classes, but if their content is good, you can simply go to their classes after the class is over and download the PDF so that you don't have to attend the entire class. Who is asking you to attend the class of each and every educator? Go and download the PDF. You will have ample content to prepare for civil services. So that's the additional benefit. Rangesh is ready. Very good. So people have answered uh, as option number two. Okay. Yes. Uh, Hmm. So, Shantini, why option number C and uh, Sivranjini, why option number C? You're just taking a guess here, right? Well, actually, it's option number B. Uh, India's external debt has never been uh, higher than India's forex reserves. Actually, the statement is wrong. India's external debt has mostly been higher than India's forex reserves. Otherwise, what would have been the problem? Why is rupee under so much pressure? I mean, think logically. You have more to pay than what you have. That, is always, that has always been India's problem. We really don't have the money to pay back. Right? So, option number B is the correct answer. Yes. Commercial borrowings by the private or the government entities is the largest component of India's external debt. We have done this question numerous times. We have also discussed the previous year question which came into UPSC. I discussed it on the Unacademy platform and here also that uh, just apply your logic that commercial borrowings, the government won't do it alone. The private entities also do it. So external commercial borrowings constitute the largest component of India's external debt followed by non-resident deposits which can be in the form of remittances or other form of money. All right. So coming to it, it was in news in the Indian Express article that we had, right? Explained forex reserves at all time high. This came in August also and this came very recently in September also. Because recently on September 4, RBI released another report saying that our foreign reserves are an all time high of $541 billion as of now, right? So they were talking about this. In fact, June 5, 2020, that is very latest, it was for the first time that our forex reserves crossed the $500 billion mark, all right? In fact, they discussed in the article that, uh, you know, we have come a long way since the 1991 time when we had a balance of payment crisis and we had barely $6 billion in our account. Now we have $500 billion in our account, right? Thank you, Hashim. Yes, Aditya, you're right. In fact, external debt has always been higher. 
otherwise why would we have a balance of payment crisis now coming to external debt we only have the march 2020 data the new data has not been released as yet as per the march 2020 data the external debt is approximately dollar 560 billion you need not remember the numbers they are just for you to set a perspective can you see it even now our forex reserve which is an all time high is 541 billion this is the latest one september 7 report all right this is september 7 that means yesterday report and still our external debt is 560 dollar billions and it will also go higher because we'll have to import a lot of things now what i want you guys to do is actually go and read this september 7 article which came in the indian express it explains forex reserves as all time high what does this happen where where are the forex reserves stored so we already know there is a forex reserves comprise of gold treasury bills from other uh, banks and most importantly the imf sdrs and the foreign currency of course and it will be interesting for you to know if you read this article that most of the forex reserves are actually held as treasury bills of other banks right and most of the foreign currency that we have is either deposited with the IMF or other central banks. Even most of the gold is with Bank of England or Bank of International Settlement. We have approximately 651 tons of gold, right? So we don't keep it here in India. We, have, we don't have it here. We have kept it with Bank of England and Bank of International Settlement and they it stays in india only a very small percentage of foreign currency or gold actually stays in india it does not stay in india so the article is not only important to know where the uh, amount of this um, a huge amount of forex reserves is kept kept the article is important to know why why is the government not utilizing the forex reserves to build the infrastructure because 80 percent of this forex infra forex reserves is actually foreign portfolio investments so it's hot money it comes in easily and it goes out easily that's why we don't do it that much and the second thing is that we are actually not earning any interest on these forex reserves the interest that we earn by the foreign banks where our money is kept is barely one percent because the rate of interest in us or eu is very very low however just for the security of the money just to have a cushion we are actually maintaining it so economists have been arguing about the goodness or the badness of this kind of forex reserves. So this is what this article explained and that is why I want you to read it because from prelims point of view it is important to understand the concept of forex reserves. Is that okay? Read this article once. If you still have doubts we will discuss it tomorrow but I want you to read it. Uh, Ronnie not everybody is good at everything. That's what I feel and importantly I would say to answer your question that if you do find everybody is very good I'm actually glad to know that then you can go and watch their recorded lectures it makes it easier actually you have so many good people teaching at one place you have all the time what do you have to do apart from studying for civil services while I was studying I never had time for anything else right all right let's start with question number two interesting question and easy question all right so your time starts now. Yes, Rangesh, I know you're ready. Question number two, any takers? Who wants to answer question number two? Nobody wants to answer question number two? We are still thinking about it? D, I guess. Aditya is guessing. Alright. Uh, actually, Afreen is right. It's option number C. Only two and four are correct. Your Kholangchu... Hydroelectric project is also with Bhutan. Your Rahu Ghat hydroelectric project is with Nepal. And Salma Dam project has been completed. It is with Afghanistan. 
I have covered this dam project in detail in my India Afghanistan series. Aditya must be aware of it. It's the IR series that we did. I think even Rangesh must be aware of it. So it's the Asia edition of the IR series, right? Where we have discussed India Afghanistan and I actually showed you the pictures of Salma Dam. It is uh, India Afghanistan friendship project or friendship dam. So the Rahu Ghat project is in Nepal on the Narayani River. And the rivers in Bhutan where we have the Mangdechu and Kolongchu hydroelectric project. It's a little difficult to pronounce their names but nonetheless we will see where they are. Alright. So uh, Afreen, Ridhima, Shantani, Rangesh are correct. Amar, it's not D, it's uh, only C. Alright. Aditya, it's option number C. So your Kolongchu power project is for 600 megawatts. Alright. And it is expected to be completed by the second half of 2025. You just need to remember the name of this project. And whenever there is Chu Cha, something like that, it is only Bhutan. So don't get confused. All right. Maximum number of hydroelectric projects are with Bhutan only. And it is on the Kholangchu River itself. Then Mangdechu hydroelectric power plant is a 720 megawatt power project. All right. With this, we are actually having 2100 megawatt already operational in Bhutan. So, there is Chukha, Kurichu and Tala hydroelectric power plant. So, Tala is a famous hydroelectric power plant which is with Bhutan. So, combining these four, it's 2100 megawatts that we are actually doing with Bhutan. We will be importing all this hydroelectric power into India. Alright, if you want to know about these power plants, their locations, Go and visit my India Bhutan IR series in India Bhutan international relations series that I have discussed all of these power projects in detail shown their locations on the map also in detail and you can find all those videos on YouTube. All right. Yeah, Aditya, it has been done recently. That's why it was in news. Is that okay? It was it happened on uh, June 29. This one happened recently. Mangdechu to is old. Mangdechu we know from 2015, 2019 when Modi had been going there. Alright. Are we good? And your Salma Dam is on the Hari River. Remember the name of the river? It's the Hari River in the Herat province of Afghanistan. That is where your Salma Dam is located. Alright. Let's come to question number 3. I'll give you 20 seconds to read. And 30 seconds to answer. It is a very, very easy one. And it's a step in the right direction. We talk about the ISRO step. The time starts now. All right, Afreen has answered me B. Uh, yes, Afreen is right, guys. This was the easiest one. We all know about Antriksh. That was the marketing arm of ISRO. And then uh, they did some sort of corruption and it fell into disrepute. So the government did not decide to actually do away with it. But instead, they actually opened another company in the 2019-20 budget which is called New Space India Limited. It is the public sector company apart from Antriksh, which will serve as the marketing arm of ISRO. So they, they did not decide to do anything about Antriksh, but they actually opened another arm. That's why it is not the only public sector company. We have Antriksh also. All right. So yes, option number B is correct. Ronnie, option number B is the correct answer. All right, not A. Now, the first one is correct. Actually, let's go and talk about the in-space organization, what it is about. So, uh, what happened was uh, around June 28, 2020, we came up with this news 
सो इन स्पेस इज इंडियन नेशनल स्पेस प्रमोशन एंड ऑथराइजेशन सेंटर ऑल राइट so they wanted to be functional within the coming 6 months 7 months whatever how it happens however i don't see it actually growing up given the current crisis um uh, we basically took a leaf out of what us has been doing what spacex has been doing for the us so as of now uh, you know the space industry is like billion dollar strong it's a huge huge industry somewhere in hundreds of dollars and india has a very small share of the pie the only work that isro does is of launching satellites in its rockets but there are a lot of other things that we can do provide satellite systems provide ground services so we really don't have that service based arm which can take care of the private sector and what happens with the private sector in india is it's not huge enough to actually support something like what spacex did so india came up with this organization called indian national space promotion authorization center this is this has been actually set up after the announcement made in the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan so yes monisha commercial arm of isro so talking about it uh, in the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan when uh, the last uh, i think 17th or 18th may when the last tranche was announced our finance minister said that we will open up the space sector all right so if we are opening up the space sector that means that the facilities that have been developed by isro can now be used by the private sector so this is this arm indian national space promotion authorization center which will act as an interface between the private sector entities and isro and will let isro know what uh, infrastructure support what kind of technological support the private entities require or what kind of business support the private entities require so that they can participate in the international space market and this will enable them to use the facilities that isro already has so that they can develop the kind of infrastructure which spacex already has and can actually contribute to indian space sector just the way spacex is contributing to the us so that's what we are trying to do by this uh it's an interesting article so if you do get a chance please read it it is there in the indian express uh i think around june 28 it was there june 28 2020 all right so it's a pretty recent announcement in space india mission space private participation isro so it's an indian express explained article go and have a look at it it will be informative for you all right uh the other reason apart from participating in the space sector the other reason why they are actually creating is so that when the manufacturing of the components when the uh, satellite launching or other things are taken care of by the private industry then isro can completely focus on science r&d and interplanetary exploration so isro can be left to do the big things rather than actually commercially exploiting these technologies all it can do is earn royalty on the technologies that it has already been developed right Uh, 11:30 a.m. Jyoti uh, in the morning on YouTube and 8:30 p.m. on An Academy. So join us on An Academy also. All right. All right. Let's come to question number four. This is an interesting question for the third point. We will discuss this in detail. This uh, requires you to know this question in detail. It's an important question for prelims. So 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. All right. Ridhima the answer to the previous question was option number B I hope you got it right Another 5 seconds and I will start the timer 11:30 Jyoti not 8:30 All right, the time starts now. Yeah, so what's wrong with the question, Roni? I have read the question. You are supposed to read the question and answer it. All right.
ओके या आई ऑलरेडी गॉट ऑलमोस्ट ऑल दी करेक्ट आंसर्स ऑप्शन नंबर टू इज इन करेक्ट दे वर एक्चुअली इंट्रोड्यूस्ड इन द वाइल्ड लाइफ प्रोटेक्शन एक्ट नाइनटीन सेवेंटी टू ऑल द कंजर्वेशन रिजर्व और द कम्युनिटी रिजर्व they are basically terms denoted for protected areas just to act as a buffer zone so for example if you remember the movie kal which was about tigers so there is a core zone where you actually find the wildlife and it's a highly protected zone and then there is a buffer zone and then your normal activities start the human activities start so that buffer zone is actually the conservation reserve or the community reserve where the forest communities can go and collect minor forest produce or do their normal activities which they do herding or pastoral farming or whatever they want to do there right so talking about this the first point is correct the third point is also correct lakshwadeep islands recently announced the creation of world's first conservation area of sea cucumbers can anybody tell me whether a sea cucumber is an animal or is it a plant is it a is it a plant species it's a normal marine species plant uh, marine plant species a seaweed or is it an animal what is a sea cucumber once you tell me that then i'll move forward because we really need to discuss this a little bit in detail because uh, upsc is pretty fond of such questions especially when it comes to marine organisms so what is it what is a sea cucumber Uh, Ronnie, you want me to read the question? Were you able to do it? Yes, it's an animal. It's an echinoderm, actually. They should have five-fold symmetry, but this looks like it's bilateral symmetry. So we'll actually see how it actually works. Ronnie, uh, just to uh, read out your question. Okay, the question is: We are talking about conservation reserves and community reserves. so conservation and community reserves are basically protected areas in india which can act as buffer zones uh, between national parks right and then there is a second point that they were introduced in the environment protection act no they were actually given by the wildlife protection act and the third point is lakshwadeep introducing creation of world's first conservation area for sea cucumbers and yes sea cucumbers are actually animals let's see how they actually look like so uh this is the photo for sea cucumbers all right if you look at them do i need to zoom it yes rudima they are marine animals in fact what is their importance in the ecosystem their importance in the ecosystem or the marine ecosystem is first they actually digest the sand so when they digest the sand they release calcium carbonate so yesterday itself we did a question on calcium carbonate that we'll have those electrodes and that steel cages where you can artificially grow the reefs the bio rock uh, accretion we discussed that yesterday and i showed you the reef in bali do you guys remember so similarly these organisms they release calcium carbonate which is very essential for corals to grow and corals are very essential for the marine ecosystem so that's the one benefit the second benefit with the sea cucumbers is that they actually uh digest or they actually consume all the sewage that is there in the sea so they kind of act as cleansers like the cockroaches do so your cockroaches clean up your entire sewage system is that okay uh are you guys following me so that's why for these two properties the sea cucumbers are very important the third for the ecosystem the third problem with the sea cucumbers is they are hunted they are harvested in lots all right and specially from the lakshwadweep islands which some of which are uninhabited so one of them is the suhali island it is uninhabited right so they are harvested because their meat is considered to be a delicacy in china and japan and it i mean even a kg of meat is extremely costly somewhere around 400 dollars right so a large a very large package of illegally harvested sea cucumbers was recently confiscated in the lakshwadweep islands right so there is a lot of news that i want you to take through so that's why i said i'll we'll discuss this one in a little bit detail now what is the iucn status they are in the category of endangered 
Sea cucumbers are in the endangered category in the IUCN status. All right. First thing. Second thing, under the Wildlife Protection Act, they are in Schedule One, so they are at par with tigers and lions. All right. But interestingly, uh, these animals don't find a mention in the CITES now. there is illegal trade happening of these species but they did not find mention in cites because of various political reasons right however very recently in august itself for the first time cites actually included white teat fish variety of the sea cucumbers so sea cucumbers have approximately 1500 species all around the world out of which approximately 150 to 173 are found in india itself so they are usually found in the park bay gulf of mannar region and the lakshadweep islands and the andaman and nicobar islands is that okay they are uh, deep sea animals and sometimes are also found in the shallow water but play mostly they are deep sea animals is that okay rangesh you should be knowing iucn list international union for conservation of nature the red list shantini which point uh, second point can you be more precise shantini which point do you want me to explain uh, that is about the sea cucumbers that why are they important for the ecosystem is that so so if that is the point see the first point is that they release calcium carbonate the second point is they eat the sewage in the sea they eat all the dead material the dead organic material in the sea so they actually clean up the sea they maintain the cleanliness of the sea that's why they are important there is no project related to uh, sea cucumbers monisha as of now but there are uh, the conserved area i will tell you the name of that that is what i am going to discuss now so i will take you to that website where they have discussed in detail all right uh, this is the first slide of explanation aditya and uh, another interesting thing they are invertebrates they don't have a vertebra so remember that all right it's an animal jyoti it's an animal all right okay aditya are we good because i want to take you to the website more clarity will be there we'll discuss this okay so uh, let me take you to that website actually where i'll show you what i want to show you uh okay now this is the website that i wanted to show you this is india.mongabay.com they actually release a lot of articles about india's marine conservation or india's wildlife conservation all right so i want to tell you that there are actually now four conservation areas in lakshadweep the first one is the pitti bird sanctuary all right it's here this is the pitti bird sanctuary all right in highlighted in blue all right so this was actually recently named in january 19 this was uh, re uh, recently named as dr salim ali bird sanctuary all right now then uh, we also have another protected area here for marine birds in india which is known as pm saeed marine birds conservation reserve all right so they this birds bird reserve is home to four species of pelagic sea birds it's here which is the greater crested tern the lesser crested tern sooty tern and the brown noddy what do you mean by pelagic sea birds pelagic means open sea open sea birds all right this is one so two we have discussed the third one the reserve here it is it is uh, which is actually yet to be declared 
So it will be the second largest global marine reserve located between Amini and Pitti archipelago in Lakshadweep Islands. It is Attakoya Thangal Marine Conservation Reserve. So it is also in the Lakshadweep. All right. And the recent one, which has been which has been actually declared for the sea cucumber, is in the Cheriapani or Veliapani Reef. The coral reef is known as Cherial Pani or Velia Pani Reef. This is here. It's spread up across 685 square kilometers. However, the first area is, uh, sorry, it's spread across 239 or 240 square kilometers at the Cherial Pani Reef. It is being called Dr. K.K. Mohammed Koya Sea Cucumber Conservation Reserve. So if you talk about Dr. K.K. Mohammed Koya Marine Reserve, then it is in Lakshwadeep. Is that okay? Everybody with me? Understood? So uh, after a lot of politicization of the issue of sea cucumbers, finally only one species as of now has been added to the sites convention and that to in appendix 2. I will take you to that news now. So here it is. After 17 years of discussions, pillaging, smuggling, all right. So, they have added the teat fish, the white teat fish that I just showed you. It's found in the Red Sea, Pacific Indian Oceans. It has finally been added to the CITES Appendix 2. That means international trade is banned or if you want to export it, you have to show the origin certificates, right? So, it's here. Now, I will show it to you. This was done in August 16, 2019. Clear, everybody? So let's go back to the PPT and let's check out. So this is what I wanted to show you. This is one of the few species of the sea cucumbers. This is the white teat fish. It's actually very beautiful and they usually are between the range of 40 to 50 centimeters only, but they can weigh between 2 to 3 kgs. All right. And they are actually usually covered with sand and found on the uh, hinges of the coral reefs. Recently, the teat fish has been recorded in Gulf of Mannar and they are also commonly found in Lakshwadi. Is that okay? So this is what I wanted to show you. What I want you guys to do is go and read the article on indiamongabay.com about Lakshwadeep unveils world's first sea cucumber conservation reserve. Though I have actually uh, introduced you to all the concepts there, but if you are more interested in knowing about it, you can actually go and visit this place. All right. Okay. Let's come to question number five. This is an easy one. So there we go. All right, you can't see the white teat fish because uh, my head was there instead of the white teat fish. <laughs> All right, okay. So, the Lampedusa Island is very, very commonly known. Nobody wants to answer it? Everybody got it correct? Yes, it's in the Mediterranean Sea. So, we'll go for a small uh, trip to Europe now. Actually, this Lampedusa Island is uh, also known as the gateway to Europe. All right. So, it is where, it is this place and the Crete Islands of Greece where most of the Syrian refugees have actually landed up or the Libyan refugees have landed up. So, people from Libya, people from Syria, they have all come to Lampedusa Island. It was recently in news because there was this rescue ship Sea Watch 3 which was refused entrance into Italy for almost 15 days. That's why this Lampedusa Island was in news. I will show it to you on the map and it is the third, it is the largest island of the Italian Pelagi Islands in the Mediterranean Sea. 
So do you guys remember I took a session on an academy where I showed you that Italy looks some like somewhat like this and there is this island of Sicily here and very closely is island of Malta. We were discussing the Mediterranean coast, right? So Sicily here and just below Sicily there are three small small islands. So they are the Pelagi Islands. What do we mean by Pelagi Islands? I already told you. Pelagi means open sea islands. They are in the open seas. So let's discuss this. Here if you go is the map of Europe. In the Unacademy sessions there was somebody asking me. Ma'am which are the countries surrounding uh, Mediterranean? So you have the occasion to see it here. Alright Aditya. So talking about this one. Okay. This place here near the Malta is are your uh, Lampedusa Islands. So basically there are a group of three islands. I will show it to you. So from Libya, this is Libya, you directly go to these islands. These are the closest to Libya. And if you go from Libya to this side, having the Libyan Sea, then you go to the island of Crete, which is also very famous. Uh, Ronnie, the map is already zoomed. This is the maximum it can zoom in. The map is already zoomed. I will show it to you. Alright. So this is the Sea of Crete and this is the island of Crete. So refugees also go here. And refugees also go to the Actually, interestingly, of these three islands, Lampedusa and one more island, they actually belong to the Libyan ter uh, Tunisian territory. However, they are occupied by Italy as of now. So, I will take you to a further more uh, elongated version of this. So, as I was talking, Malta is here. These three islands are here. So, your Lampedusa and Lampione are actually in Tunisian territorial waters but they are occupied by Italy, alright? And Linosa is the third island. So Lampedusa is the largest pelagic islands of Italy. Is that clear? Is everybody with me? Are we clear? Okay, let's move on to question number six. If you have any doubts in the map, let me know. I will go back to the map and explain it to you, alright? So coming to question number 6, since we have been talking about the freedom of navigation, it is almost every other day in the news due to the South China Sea. So it is important to know what the freedom of navigation actually means. So 20 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. Your time starts now. Guys, do you want to read the question again? Because all of you have answered me incorrectly. Read the first point again. Do you ever have anything without any exceptions? You don't, right? So option number one is automatically wrong. And the third one is actually right because yes, not all. We usually, if actually all the members have signed the UN Clause Convention of the Sea, it would be in news. But that has not happened. In fact, what has happened is, you will be amazed to know, uh, no, it's not D also. It's actually uh, option number C. Only 2 and 3 are correct. 
So not all UN members have ratified the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. Example, very big example and to everybody's shock is the United States. The United States has not yet ratified the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. It has signed the convention but not ratified it. Is that okay? Because the Senate blocks it every single time. And the first one is incorrect because there are exceptions. So freedom of navigation means if any ship wants to go through the international waters, it can go. If it is not causing any distress to anybody. Do you remember we discussed the white, sh white shipping and the black shipping and the grey shipping agreements yesterday? You guys remember that? White shipping, black shipping uh, and grey shipping agreements. The white shipping is about the vessels which are normal commercial vessels which do not cause any worry. Grey shipping is for military and the black is illegal vessels, right? We discussed that. Yes, Monisha, Ridhima and Rangesh, it is C. So, if it is a ship which is not causing any distress to anyone, it can actually pass through. That's freedom of navigation. However, if it is a military vessel or it is trying to cause some sort of discomfort to the nation in which, uh, in the territorial waters of which it is actually going through, then the nation has the right to actually stop it or investigate it, right? Now, yes, the right to freedom of navigation is codified under the UN clause or UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. And yes, not all member states have ratified the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. The most glaring example being the US. All right. Yes, Naveen, why it is commercial. Now, coming to it, why this thing is in news and what exactly happened. So, the problem is that ideally, no country should have a problem with other country using the international waters. However, what China says is that, Whenever you in, enter in Chinese international waters, every single time you have to take permission. And that's why United States keep doing FONOPS or Freedom of Navigation uh, uh, Military Exercises, Operations. All right. So FONOPS are Freedom of Navigation, uh, uh, what do you say, Operational Exercises, Operational Programs that they keep doing. And the entire thing of freedom of navigation has been codified in article 87 1 of the 1982 UN clause. So they have actually codified what this freedom of navigation means. All right. So any ship that is flying the flag of any sovereign state, they will not suffer any interference from other states apart from the exceptions provided for in the international law. All right. Yes, Radhima, gray is for military vessels. Talking about this, there was a very interesting article which I have highlighted the link here. I want you guys to read it. From strategic point of view, this article is very important to understand why US is navigating the South China Sea, why India is participating and yet China is not listening. Now, this was an article in time.com. So, interestingly, you know, when the UN clause was developed in 1982, that was after like ages of negotiation, finally they came up with UN clause. And that was, even when they came up with it, that was keeping in mind the benefits that can accrue to United States. But still, they were very protectionist and they refused to sign it. Any which ways, China has signed and ratified the agreement in 1996. So China, India, almost 168 countries are signatory to the UN clause. All right. But with USA, the Republicans, so there are two parties, Democrats and the Republicans. The Republicans are very protectionist, so they haven't actually ratified the UN clause. And uh, USA has signed it and USA has only signed even the amendment on the UN clause that came in 2002, I guess. They haven't even signed the treaty as yet. So what happens in the South China Sea when USA keeps telling China that, you know, you follow the international norms, etc., etc., China is like, dude, you haven't even signed it. You haven't even ratified it. Forget about me following the rules. You don't even, uh, you know, for you, don't, they don't even exist. You haven't even signed it. You even haven't given it, you know, legality in your own dominion or in your own domination. So that is why they're not listening to the US. However, given all these conditions, the US Army or the US Navy, they do maintain that it's a very big flaw in their governance and they should ratify it. So that nobody can point fingers at them. But overall, 
the US Navy does follow the international rules which are listed under the UN clause. Is that understood? So let's move on to question number 7 now. These are all large thermal power plants. Alright. So I will give you 30 seconds, 20, 15 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. And your time starts now. Uh, only Afreen has answered me. Anybody else wants to answer this? Anybody else wanting to answer this? Because I've got only one answer as of now. Nobody wants to answer this? Is it that difficult? Because this is the last question on thermal power plants. We have covered almost the entire nation's thermal power plants now. We are done with the map. This is the last question on thermal power plants today. Only Afreen, uh, Naveen has answered me correctly. Afreen, it's not option B. It's actually option number D. Telangana, Chhattisgarh and Uttar Pradesh. All are correctly matched here. Jyoti Nagar is in Telangana. So Jyoti Nagar is very close to the Ramagundam thermal power plant. Alright, Jamani Palli is actually your Korba thermal power plant in Chhattisgarh. Korba is a very famous place. Anpara is in Uttar Pradesh. Interestingly, uh, both these and in fact the three of these are very large thermal power plants, approximate capacity of 3000 megawatts. Alright, uh, Solar Rajan, it's option number D. Alright, why has nobody else answered? What happened? You were waiting for me to answer the question? Is that so? Or everybody decided to skip it? Okay. Uh, let's just zoom in. So if you notice, we have done Obra Dam. We have done Anpara. We have done the Rihan. All the three, Obra, Anpara and Rihan, they are on the Rihan River or the Renuka River. Right? Sivranjini, it's option number D. Okay? So, Anpara is on the Rihan River. Jamani Palli is your Korba power plant. It gets its water from the Hasdeo River, which is a tributary of Mahanadi. Jamani Palli is a place in Korba Chhattisgarh. All right. Last is your Jyoti Nagar, which is very close to the Ramagundam thermal power plant, which is in Telangana. So, here it is. Uh, it gets its water from Sri Ram Sagar project, the Pochampar Dam. It is also called the lifeline of Tilangana. So, I don't know if anybody is from Tilangana, they must be knowing about it. Sri Ram Sagar project or the Pochampar Dam is on the Godavari River. I will show it to you also. So, this is actually the Godavari River. I have drawn it in black. Alright. This is the Godavari River. And this red mark here is actually your Pochampad Reservoir or the lifeline of Tilangana. This is where the Jyoti Nagar uh, plant, thermal power plant actually gets its water from. Is that okay? And the origin of Godavari happens at Triambakeshwar. It is one of the famous 12 Jyotirlings in India. It is in Maharashtra. Let's move on to question number 8. So, this is a fairly easy one. So, your time starts now.
So anybody wants to answer this? Who's answering this one? Nobody wants to answer this. Should I tell the answer already? Okay. So, Aralam, Mudumulai, Mukurthi, uh, Shantani, you are correct. Both one and two are actually part of it. Rajiv Gandhi National Park is nothing but Nagarhol National Park. We already discussed Nagarhol National Park yesterday, day before yesterday. So, the Kaveni River, which is a tributary of Kaveri, actually flows through it, the Kaveni Reservoir. Yes? So, Shivranjani is correct. Naveen, it's option number A. Solaranjan is also correct. Kaveni, you were correct. It's option number 1. You are correct. So, Rajiv Gandhi's Nagarhol National Park, Bandipur and Silent Valley. All these national parks are a part of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve and Vainad in Karnataka, sorry, in Kerala and Satyamangalam in Tamil Nadu are the wildlife centuries which are a part of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves. In fact, the Satyamangalam forest in Tamil Nadu, they act as a bridge between the Eastern Ghats and the Nilgiris. Alright, so let's take a look at the map. This is important because, you know, Nilgiri Forest Reserve is one of the earliest one which has been a part of the Man in the Biosphere program. So, you should know what are the consequent wildlife centuries or national parks which are a part of it. So, this is your Nagarhol National Park. So, from Vainad, your Kabini River actually comes out. This is the Kabini River that actually goes through the Nagarhol National Park which we discussed already. We discussed Kabini River when we discussed the Nanjagod. Uh, bananas, all right. So, they are the famous bananas. We discussed about them, and that's when we discussed about the Kavini Reservoir. <coughs> so, your Bandipur is here. This is your Satyamangalam Forest Division, and as you can see, it actually connects your Nilgiri Plateau. This entire region is your Nilgiri Plateau to the Eastern Ghats, which is here. Here is your Mukurthi National Park in Tamil Nadu, alright, the Silent Valley here in uh, Kerala and the Mudubalai of course again in Tamil Nadu. So that's, I really wanted you to know this, it's important to know what comprises actually this. So Nilgiri is spread across three states, your Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala, alright. Let's come to question number 9. This is fairly easy. So, 30 seconds to answer it. This is pretty easy guys. This should have been answered by now. Alright. So, anybody has any idea what this is about? Everybody should have idea about what this is about actually. So, I will answer it because I don't think anybody wants to answer it or you guys have absolutely no clue what it is about. Alright. Naveen has finally answered it. It is option number C. Yes. The deferred action for childhood arrivals is actually a very old policy given by Obama in 2012 before he was leaving the final presidency term. So basically, it talks about the children who have arrived as illegal immigrants to US will not be deported back immediately. They will, it will, the US will try to assemble them as a part of naturalized citizens as they grow up. So it's a beneficiary... Uh, act that was given out by Barack Obama. So recently the Supreme Court of the US, they actually uh, forbade Trump from completely destroying this act or actually destroying this measure that was taken earlier. So that's why this thing was in news. Alright. 
this was there in the Hindustan Times. So I just wanted you to know that it came from the United States. Uh, Sola, it's C. And Ashlesha, it's C. You're right. Last question for today. The Tilhan mission. We have discussed it before. So if you remember it, it will be pretty easy to answer. This was in news in February 2020. Is your answer option number C, Patwari? Then it's correct. It's make India self-reliant. Yes. In all C production. So it is regarding making India self-reliance in oil seed production. It was in news. Uh, it was actually announced on the Soil Health Card Day, which is 19th of Feb. All right. It was there in news on DD News. The government to launch the Tilhan mission to boil oil seed production. They haven't done much about it. So let's see how they are actually going to do about it. Because in March itself, the coronavirus crisis hit. So everything has taken a backseat. I think they should be reviving this mission now. So with that, I'll end today's session. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you have been a wonderful audience. So if there are any doubts, if you have any doubts related to the map of the Europe or anything else, please let me know. Else we'll call it a day. And see you guys tomorrow. So we'll call it a day. All right, guys, then. Thank you and have a good day.